All right, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to um, welcome everyone to class today. You should have in front of you a set of notes for uh, lesson 45 titled Jot and Tittle Preservation, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Part 2. Um, so we're going to be uh, looking at the sort of the second half of what we started last week here as we look at lesson 45. Um, so if you would also open up in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Also open up to Matthew chapter 5. So what we started looking at last week is how Matthew 5, 17 and 18 relate to the issue of preservation. Okay, So I just want to read those verses and then I want to say a few things by way of review. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Matthew 5, 17, uh, Christ says, think not, think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Okay? Now the reason we're talking about Matthew 5, 17 is because two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I started talking to you about this uh, amended position with respect to preservation. And this is the third Sunday now that I've been sort of working off this chart. So the chart again starts with the idea that, planet, that uh, inspiration and preservation are both uh, the Bible's claims for themselves. It works its way down here to the idea that preservation is the corollary of inspiration. But it identifies the false assumption that is underlying the entire textual variant discussion and leading to unscriptural conclusions being that uh, inspiration and pres that preservation is uh, occurring with the same level of precision and so forth as inspiration. So in other words, the idea that plenary verbal preservation requires verbatim identicality. And so we worked our way down here to the center and we saw that we need to exercise caution and realize that variant readings are historical fact, that that's true for the Byzantine, the manuscripts of the Byzantine text type that support the, the, the traditional text, that's true for editions of the Textus Receptus, and that's true for uh, the printings of the King James Bible. None of them are exactly verbatim identical with each other, okay? So we then identified that that phenomenon has led to two positions that don't really lead anywhere. They, add, they, they lead to dead ends. The first one is the originals only position. And the second one is the faith for faith's sake position that don't really deal, in my opinion, honestly, with the textual and the, and the biblical facts. So what we've been exploring here recently is this third option that the solution to it is not to dump preservation, it's not to deny the promise of preservation, but the solution is to look back to the scripture which taught you to believe in preservation in the first place and let them inform you about how to deal now with the secondary issue about the nature and extent of preservation. And we said that when you do that, you realize that it was demanding too much to begin with to think that preservation was going to be, uh, be verbatim because the scriptures would not lead you themselves to believe that. Okay, And we looked at four proofs of that. How the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the New Testament, and then that comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. Now the reason why all that comes up is because of Matthew 5.17 and how Matthew 5.17 has been used uh, by those arguing for option number two or the King James only position to say that there has to be jot and tittle preservation, that it has to be verbatim identical, that there cannot be any punctuation mark, any letter, uh, everything has to be in pristine verbatim identicality in order for you to have preservation. And so we saw that last Sunday when we looked at some of the teachings that are out there regarding that. Okay, So if you look at your notes, last week in Lesson 44, we looked at the use of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 by King James Only Advocates. In doing so, we observed that many King James defenders use Matthew 5 to establish their insistence upon verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. In this lesson, we want to look at the use of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 by those who have been critical of the King James only position. 
In conclusion, I will offer my own thoughts on how these verses should be properly understood. Now, before we get into the new material, there's one point that I want to read to you from last week's notes that we skipped over because we were running short on time and we still ran five minutes over. And this is a statement from the 2006 third edition of Defending the King James Bible by D.A. Waite. Okay, so if you, if you have last week's notes, this would be page 8, and I'm reading from the first, uh, the first bullet at the top of that page. He says the following about these two verses in Matthew. He says, quote, Not one jot, nor one tittle. That is Bible preservation, isn't it? Now, he, now he's talking about the Old Testament. So, Wait is identifying that what Christ is talking about there in those verses, is he speaking about what? The Old Testament. But then he says, and I'm sure by extension we can carry that on to the New Testament as well. Okay, so understand what Wade is doing. He's first saying that, that verse, those two verses teach preservation and that they teach preservation in an identical fashion. He acknowledges that Christ is speaking particularly here about the Old Testament and then he takes that and he extrapolates that onto the entire New Testament. Okay, so he says, I am sure by extension we can carry that on to the New Testament as well. The Lord Jesus says, said, excuse me, that not one jot or tittle would pass from the law until all would be fulfilled. So the Lord Jesus believed in Bible preservation, didn't he? There is good evidence that a tittle is the smallest Hebrew vowel, which is a dot, and he goes on about that. But what I want you to see is he's, he's, he's identifying that as saying that the preservation extends all the way to the jots and tittles. He identifies that Christ is speaking there particularly about the Old Testament, but then he extrapolates that out and says the same thing would apply to what? The New Testament. Okay, so now let's look at the first point which is use of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 by those critical of the King James only position. So, in Lesson 44, we use Gary C. Webb's essay, Not One Jot or One Tittle, Matthew 5, 17, and 18, from Thou Shalt Keep Them, a biblical theology of the perfect preservation of Scripture as a means for framing the discussion. In like manner, in this lesson, we will use William C. Combs' essay, The Preservation of Scripture, as a framework for structuring our study. Combs commences his discussion of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 by noting that the passage is one of the most commonly referenced scriptures used to support the preservation of scripture. Moreover, he identifies the dot and tittle as follows. Regarding the jot, he says, quote, It is universally agreed that the jot, or iota, uh, refers to the Hebrew or Aramaic letter, yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? Tittle. The tittle literally means horn, that is a projection or hook. This has often been understood to refer to the small parts of letters, especially to the small strokes distinguishing Hebrew letters. Okay? So he's saying that the jot and the tittle is referring to the most finest detail of written what? Scripture. Of written, he particularly Hebrew. Okay? <laughs> So when taken at face value, Combs concedes that the phrase could be understood to teach the absolute perfect preservation of the law. Combs then cites Richard Flanders' essay, Does the Bible Promise Its Own Preservation as a Case in Point? Flanders writes, quote, Some say that this promise refers only to the fulfillment of Scripture and not to its preservation. But notice that it says the text of the Bible to the very letter will not pass in the, in the sense that heaven and earth shall one day pass. The Greek word used here for pass is uh, uh, paralethi, and it refers to the physical extinction of a thing that shall pass. It can also be translated perish. Just as God's creation will pass someday, God's words will, not, will never pass. The actual existence, now watch, the actual existence of the original text of Scripture will continue how long? Eternally, just as the physical existence of heaven and earth will not what? Continue. So mark well the nature of Flanders' position. He makes two important assertions. Number one, 
that the text of the Bible, the very, uh, the very letter will not pass, and two, the actual existence of the original text of Scripture will continue eternally. How is this accomplished according to Flanders? By preservation, of course. If this is not a statement arguing for verbatim preservation, I'm not sure what is. So he's saying that the exact, that the exact original wording is going to be what? Preserved in pristine identicality. Okay, that's what he's saying. And what verse is he using to say that? Matthew. He's using Matthew. He's using Matthew. Okay. Now, notice in verse 18 that in your Bible it doesn't actually... It, he, if you go back to page 1, bottom of page 1, Flanders says at the bottom of page 1, he says, Just as God's creation will pass someday, God's words will never pass. Is, is, do you see anything in verse 18 about God's words? Read verse 18. For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So Flanders is saying that this verse is assuring the absolute pristine verbatim identicality of preservation. Okay? Now go to the next point on page, go back to page two. Combs is quick to jump on this point in his comments following the Flanders quote. He says, quote, Flanders' interpretation is just how Matthew 5.18 is commonly understood from the King James Texas Receptus viewpoint. Cloud explains, he's talking about David Cloud, he explains, in summary, the Bible promises that God will preserve his words in pure form, including the most minute details, the jots and the tittles, the words, and that, this would, and that this would include the whole scripture, Old and New Testaments. The biblical doctrine of preservation is verbal plenary preservation. Waite describes this as the inerrant preservation of the words of the Bible. But in fact, these advocates for the King James Texas Receptus position do not actually take Ma uh, Ma excuse me, Matthew 5.18 literally, even though they claim to do so. If not one jot or tittle is to be changed, then they should insist upon using only the 1611 edition of the King James, since jot and tittle certainly involve spelling, and there have been thousands of spelling changes since 1611. Okay? Now, does everybody see what Combs is saying? He's saying, look, if you're going to take this as your standard, if this is your text to prove this, then you need to apply it to the, to the printed history of the Bible that you're claiming is what? The, the, the perfectly preserved one, okay? Now, I've already showed you uh, in, in, in a very sort of rudimentary way that there are more differences between these editions of the King James Bible than simply changes in what? Spelling. What do you do when a whole word is in one edition but not in another edition? What do you do when some of the word order is changed from one edition to another edition? Okay? So does everybody understand how, how Combs now is, he's taking the way that verse has been used by King James only advocates and he's basically saying to them here, if this is what you guys think, then why are you not consistent in your application? Is everybody understanding what I'm saying? All right, any questions about that so far? Okay. So Combs has just pointed out something King James advocates have not dealt with honestly in my opinion. If they are going to demand verbatim identicality to the very jot and tittle, which edition of the King James exactly reproduced the original autographs? As we will see below, even Flanders is forced to hedge on this point later in his essay. Okay? Now Combs has the King James only advocates pinned right where he wants him in order to deliver what he thinks is the final deciding factual blow. Okay, he says, quote, There are two things to be said about the King James Texas Receptus interpretation of, Ma of Matthew 5.18. First, it is an incontrovertible fact, obvious to anyone who has examined the manuscript evidence, that we do not now possess the words of the autographs in an absolutely inerrant state. Now that is his code word for saying what? He's saying we don't have them in verbatim identicality. He's saying there's variant what? Readings. Okay. Then he goes on and says, This assertion is most significant since it flatly contradicts the whole thesis of the King James Texas Receptus position. 
I will demonstrate the truth of this assertion later in this essay. Second, Jesus is not teaching in this verse the inerrant preservation of the words of the Bible. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. But Combs is saying, well, which one of these what? Which is the one that got everything what? Absolutely perfect. Okay. So, discussing Combs' statement. Let's now dissect Combs' statement. First, Combs is correct. We cannot know for certain what the words of the original were if one demands verbatim identicality as their standard for preservation and inerrancy. Can these guys know that any more than these guys without the original in front of them? No. Okay? So let me read that again. First, Combs is correct. We cannot know for certain what the original of the original were if one demands verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation and inerrancy. Moreover, he is correct that this fact alone causes the King James only notion that Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is teaching exact identicality of wording, the very jots and tittles, as the standard for preservation to suffer damage. Even within the Byzantine text, the textual tradition that King James advocates favor as the preserved text line, there is not verbatim identicality of wording. The same could be said for the printed editions of the Textus Receptus, as well as the various editions of the King James Bible itself. In this way, the King James only position is unscriptural because it demands more for the doctrine of preservation than what the Bible actually asserts. Now, did everybody hear me say that? That's going to get me in trouble, but I said it anyway. Okay? They are going too far, and they are demanding more than they can want. Prove. Okay? Because what is the standard they are adopting? They're adapting verbatim identicality. Okay? Now, second, what is Combs' standard for speaking about an absolutely inerrant state? It is none other than the standard of verbatim identicality and wording. While Combs is correct in his criticism of the King James only position, on the other side of the spectrum, he is arguing for the absolute inerrancy of the original autographs that no longer exist and in which no one alive has ever seen. What verse of Scripture teaches you to believe that God can find his inspired and inerrant word to some non-existent pieces of parchment? Okay, so again, we are back to the same thing. Are both, are both of these... Are both of these positions here, options one and two, are they both claiming and making suppositions that they can't prove? Okay. Next, po um, next point. In this way, both sides are making unscriptural assumptions and talking past each other with the issue of exact sameness or verbatim identicality being the great mount impassable that divides them. Recall from Lesson 40 that the language in the original autographs was added to Protestant doctrinal statements in the later half, should say latter or later half, of the 19th century as a means of answering German, the German higher critics and rationalists. In this way, Protestant Christians reworked their position on the Bible based upon terms set by their opponents. We've already covered this, okay? This reworked bibliology became the new orthodoxy in fundamental and evangelical circles in the 20th century. In the same way that Protestant scholars in the 19th century overreacted to the forces of liberalism, believers in the 20th century overreacted to the new originals only orthodoxy by overstating their case in the opposite direction. Therefore, cordial and productive dialogue on this topic has proved elusive. Both sides are separated by the same thing. The false assumption that preservation requires verbatim identicality. They don't realize it and are therefore talking past each other. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? I abs as I've thought about this and studied it and as I've taught on it, I absolutely believe this is what has happened. Okay? So if I could just sort of sketch that out for you quickly. So remember we went over this, uh, we went over Protestant 
view on the Bible before, um, before 1860. Remember we did that in Lesson 40, right? So then this position is attacked by German higher criticism. So I'm just going to abbreviate that. GHC is German higher criticism and, and, and rationalism. All right. So they attack the, the traditional Protestant view of the Bible that existed before 1860. This attack is going to be met by Protestants, and they are going to rework Protestant bibliology. They're going to rework the view of the Bible because of the criticism that are leveled by these guys. Okay? This then comes down into the 20th century and is, is the new orthodoxy, all the stuff about the originals. The formation of the King James only position is a reaction in the 20th century against this position. Okay? So by the time you get here, you're already two steps away from what the original position was. Okay? And the big mountain, the big mountain passable here in the middle is the issue of variant what? Readings. Why are these guys, why did these guys, and by extension these guys in the 20th century, why are they limiting all this stuff to the originals only? They're limiting it to the originals only is because of the presence of variant what? Now who called everybody's attention to that? Those guys right there. So these guys form a position as a reaction to these guys, which becomes the new orthodoxy down to the 20th century. The King James only view is a, res is a response against that view. The thing that is separating them is this issue of ver uh, verbatim identicality or variant readings, and they're talking past each other because they're not, uh, they're not able to identify in the conversation what they're actually arguing about. Okay? Now, that's a mouthful. Hopefully, is everybody at least following what I'm saying? Now, I'm working on developing a chart that is much nicer than this as a follow-up chart to that chart that's on the board there to explain this a little bit more clearly and succinctly. Okay? Now, look at the next point in the notes. The position that I'm arguing for in this class is both scriptural as well as as logical and in line with the historical and textual facts. The scriptures assert their own inspiration. They assert their own preservation, which means we must have more than the non-existent originals. They do not, however, teach verbatim identicality as the standard for what? For preservation. So let me just recap in case somebody is watching and is unclear. Do I believe in inspiration? Yes. yes. Do I believe in preservation? Yes. yes. Do I believe in, the, in preservation the way that the King James Only Movement has historically articulated preservation? No. I am arguing for a revised understanding, a, a biblically amended understanding of preservation based upon what the Bible says about itself, not some rationalistic presuppositions. Okay, we saw last week, right? The guys in option two, they're saying about the guys in option one, you're making rationalistic presuppositions. The guys in option one are saying, what about the guys in option two? You guys are making rationalistic presuppositions. Okay? So, above we saw, it's, the, oh yeah. Just to be clear, when you say you believe in inspiration, do you mean verbal, a plenary verbal inspiration? Or yes. Inspiration? I believe in that God inspired every word, yes. Every, every plenty word. of verb, plenty of verbal. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All its parts. Okay. Not just the parts I like, or the parts that speak to me, okay. or... How do you know that? I believe that because of what the scriptures teach about inspiration. That's why I believe that. I believe in preservation because the scriptures promise preservation. So partly you're going to option number two for... Belief. Well, let's read option two. Option two pretends like the variant readings don't exist and insists upon plenary verbal preservation. Okay? So... That part, you know. That part is going too far, okay? 
Some incorrectly insist that God re-inspired his word in English between 1604 and 1611 as a means of providing the verbatim identicality of wording that preservation demands. Remember we talked about this last week. Ruckman came to the conclusion that the only way he could salvage this verbatim identicality ship is if he came out and said that the King James translation itself was what? Inspired. Inspired. Okay? Because that's the only way he can uh, that's the only way he could logically account for the verbatim identicality of the position that he was arguing for. Okay? So, what I said here is this position has the correct starting point. Okay? It is consistent with the fadistic believing approach to scripture, but here's the problem. It carries the corollary between preservation and inspiration too far. So that's why I'm coming over here and I'm saying I believe in inspiration, I believe in the promise of preservation, but I believe in my own, as I think about how I should understand preservation, I should look back to the scripture and let the scripture teach me how to think about how the preservation occurred. Okay? So, as we saw above, as we above we saw, excuse me, that Combs quoted Richard the quoted Richard Flanders article does the prom, does the Bible promise its own preservation? To buttress his point regarding the use of Matthew 5, 17 and 18, some King James uh, let me read that, I messed that up. I'm sorry. Above we saw that Combs quoted Richard Flanders' article, Does the Bible Promise Its Own Preservation to Buttress His Point Regarding the Use of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 by Some King James Advocates. A deeper look at Flanders' article will prove instructive. Flanders offers the connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Hebrew Masoretic Text as historical proof of the promise of preservation as well as existence of the traditional Hebrew text supporting the King James Bible from before the time of Christ. Now, remember we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls a little bit last time. Flanders quotes Drs. Gleason Archer and Randall Price to support his position. So, from Archer, he quotes the following. This is from a 1974 book, uh, 73 or 74 book Archer wrote. The Hebrew University Isaiah Scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls corresponds almost letter for letter with the traditional text and yet dates from 500 BC. Notice what I've highlighted. Almost. 50 BC. Almost. Is it verbatim? Almost. It's almost verbatim, which means it's not what? Verbatim. Price. Once a comparison is made between the Hebrew text of the Isaiah scroll and the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text, it is evident that except for minor details, such as what? Spelling, that do not affect the meaning of the text. The two were almost what? <coughs> Identical. Now understand, has Flanders already made a point about the exact reproduction of the original autographs? And now later on in the essay, to, to support his point, to buttress his point, he's quoting two guys that are saying that the Isaiah scroll from B.C. is almost what? Identical. Is everybody following that? So please note that Flanders, please note that Flanders quotes do not quite support his position. Above we quoted Flanders as saying the following with respect to Matthew 5, 17 and 18. But uh, quote, but notice that it says the text of the Bible to the very what? Letter will not pass in the sense that heaven and earth shall one day pass. But then later on in the same essay, when seeking to furnish historical proof of jot and tittle preservation, Flanders quotes two scholars who, stop, who stopped short of the exact identicality and preservation that Flanders had previously used for Matthew 5, 17 and 18 to argue. He says, this is what Matthew 5, 17 and 18 teaches. Then later on he quotes two scholars to try to support that point, who stopped short of saying what he's actually trying to what? Say. 
Okay? Next, note the underlined portion of the quote from Price. Read it again. It says, do not affect the meaning of what? So, can you have differences, different ways of saying the same thing, that don't impact the meaning of the text? That don't alter the fundamental doctrinal content of the text? So, next note, the underlying portion of the quotes from Price. Price admits that one does not need verbatim identicality for the text to convey the exact same meaning without possessing the exact same what? Words. Words. I love it when people make my point for me. Okay? Without realizing the inconsistencies in his argumentation, <clears throat> Following the quotes by Archer and Price, Flanders goes on to highlight a very interesting point in the opposite direction. Consider what he says about the nature of textual variance. Quote, To my friend, however, and many scholars like him, the most significant find at the Dead Sea in regard to the Bible's text was the existence of, textu uh, was the existence of what? Variant, variant text. The principles of modern textual criticism are based on the assumption that the exact preservation of the original text of an ancient document is extremely what? What did he just tell you? He just told you that the standard, that the, that the whole reason why these guys have limited their position to the originals only is because there is not, what's it say? Exact what? Preservation. Preservation. So they look at the evidence. These, these clowns right here, German higher critics and rationalists, they point out the variant readings. Oh! Well, we need to then confine, the way around this now is to confine it to what? Original. The originals only. Okay? And so when you confine it to the originals only, you drop what doctrine? Preservation. You drop preservation as a biblical promise. Now we've already seen that later on you have to insert it in the back door as a historical reality, but you drop it as a fundamental promise and you write a bunch of stuff talking about how the Bible doesn't promise its own preservation. Okay? So these guys are doing what they are doing because of the existence of what? Variant readings, yet Price just said that you can have something that says the exact same thing without saying it in the exact same what? Wording. wording. Is everybody with that? Let's go back to the notes. What point am I on? Seriously. This statement? Okay. Excuse me. This statement on the part of Flanders highlights precisely why modern textual critics adopt a reconstructionist approach to the text. They do not believe in the promise of preservation on the count of the fact that it did not occur with what? Exact identicality. What are the folks in position two arguing for? They're arguing that it did occur with exact what? So then the folks in position one say to the folks in position two, they say, well, which one got everything exactly right? Well, you just got to believe by faith. <clears throat> and so they double down on faith for faith's sake, and they don't answer what? They don't answer the question. The whole reason why the problem exists is because instead of going back, okay, instead of going back to the same Bible that led to this Protestant doctrinal position to begin with, instead of going back to the Bible, they met these guys head on on terms that they allowed these guys to set for them. Okay? And when they did that, they lost something very important to the bibliology, and that is an understanding of preservation. So when they encountered these variant readings that the German higher critics are talking about, instead of meeting these guys head on and figuring out this way of dealing with them, they should have went back to the Bible and let the Bible inform them how to view what? 
Textual variance. So at this point, it might be good to remind everyone <clears throat> regarding the definition of the English word preservation. Noah Webster defines the word as follows in the American Dictionary of the English Language. Preservation. The act of preserving or keeping safe. The act of keeping from injury, destruction, or decay as the preservation of one's life or health, the preservation of buildings from fire or decay, the preservation of grain from insects, the preservation of fruit or plants. When a thing is kept entirely from decay or nearly in its original state, we say it has a high state of what? Now, why did I point that out? Even the English Dictionary's definition of the word preservation says that as long as a thing is kept from decay and nearly in its original state, it classifies as what? Preservation. preservation. Has God preserved His Word? He has preserved His Word. He promised that He would preserve His Word. Did He preserve it in a state of verbatim identicality? No. Did he preserve it in a pure state that doesn't report any information that's false? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, even... Hang on a second. <clears throat> even, even according to the dic English dictionary, something does not have to be in an exactly identical state or condition in order to qualify as having been what? Preserved. Preserved. Combs and Glenny on the correct Combs and Glenny on the correct understanding of Matthew 17 and 18. <clears throat> Having rejected how many King James advocates utilize Matthew 5, 17 and 18 in their argumentation, Combs offers the following alternative. He says, quote, Matthew 5, 18 is first of all an example of hyperbole, a conscious exaggeration or a type of overstatement in order to increase the effect of what is being said. In a graphic way, then, this text makes a point similar to Isaiah 40, verse 8. If uh, not the smallest letter or stroke, now this is, this is uh, if not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until, until all is accomplished. The law is immutable, it stands forever. No part of the law, not the most insignificant letter, was to be set aside. The law is unalterable. But unlike Isaiah 40, verse 8, this text is more directly tied to Scripture since law... In, now, by the way, we already studied Isaiah 40, verse 8. I didn't, agree, we, I didn't agree with the way he explained that. Just to refresh your memory, you'd have to go back and look at that lesson particularly. Okay? But again... This, uh, excuse me, but unlike Isaiah 48, this, 40 verse 8, this text is more directly applied to Scripture since law in verse 18 is at least a reference to the Torah, more probably the entire Old Testament. But again, this is not to be taken literally as though Jesus were promising that no Hebrew manuscript could be changed or that no copyist could make an error. This is simply a hyperbolic way of saying that God's written revelation cannot be changed. If the scripture cannot be changed, then it obviously remains valid with full authority. Thus the emphasis in Matthew 5.18 is more on the authority and validity of the Old Testament, not primarily its preservation. As Mu observes, probably, uh, probably then we should understand verse 18 to be an endorsement of the continuing usefulness or authority of the law. Thus this verse makes no direct affirmation concerning preservation. However, the emphasis is on the continuing authority of the scriptures can by implication be used to argue for the preservation of those scriptures. We'll talk about that next week. In summation, Com in summation Combs views the passage as dealing more generally with the authority and validity of the Old Testament than with the exact preservation of every word of scripture. W. Edward Glennie, writing in 1997, a few years before Combs, took a similar yet somewhat different, took a similar yet somewhat different understanding of Matthew 5, 17 through 18. He says, Matthew 5, 18 is clearly speaking of the fulfillment in Christ of Old Testament ethical and prophetic texts. <clears throat> 
When Matthew writes in verse 18, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, it must be read in light of this context. Verse 17 says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The point of the verse is that Jesus did not come to destroy or to uh, perpetuate, perpetuate uh, for that matter, the Old Testament law. He is the one of whom the Old Testament law points to. And he came to fulfill all that was prophesied about him. Ryrie comments in his study notes that the Lord's point is that, every is that every letter of every word in the Old Testament is vital and will be fulfilled. This passage is not speaking about the preservation of the exact words found in the autographia. It is declaring that all the prophecies in the Old Testament which point to Christ will be fulfilled down to the smallest detail. In addition, the context makes it clear that Jesus is speaking about the fulfillment of every detail of the Old Testament text. Matthew 5.18 does not ever refer to the New Testament text, let alone of its perfect supernatural preservation. So understand, what I started the lesson out by quoting from you D.A. Waite. What did D.A. Waite say about the verse? He said the verse was talking about the absolute preservation of every word down to the very jot and tittle of the Old Testament and then by extension to what? The New Testament. The New Testament okay? What is Glennie saying here? Glennie's saying is that the text is not talking about preservation specifically. It's talking about the fact that in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the details, prophetic statements that are back there in the law, that Christ was going to fulfill them even to the smallest what? John Tittle, even to the smallest detail. Okay? And then he's saying, there's certainly no reason to think what Wade is saying, that by extension, so in other words, if it's, if it's not primarily dealing with the preservation of every John and Tittle of the Old Testament, and it's dealing with the fulfillment of the law by Christ, then there's certainly no reason to, by extension, think that it is talking about the preservation of every John and Tittle of what? The New Testament. The New Testament. Okay? So, in a nutshell, Glennie is saying that Matthew 5, 7, 18, and 18 are asserting that even the smallest details of the Old Testament are going to be what? Fulfilled. So, before we get to the conclusion, does anybody have any questions, comments about all this? Craig? I agree with what he's, I think I agree with what he says there. Anybody else? But I, just to comment a little bit about what um, Mike asked about the jots and tittles being inspired. I think the jots and tittles were inspired just by the fact that it was written down in Hebrew. They were a part of that language that it was being written down in. So it would be like um, an apostrophe in English that denotes um, possession. Without that, you lose, you lose meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's just a consequence of the language that it was written in. You see, you see what I mean? But doesn't that demand exact, exactness then? Well, of course. That's why, I say, that's why I say you take verbal and plenary off of it. But it's not like God said put an iota there. An iota was just a consequence of the fact that it was written in Hebrew. Yeah, except that changes the meaning. That there's a reason they use iotas and exactly. And, uh, right, well, exactly. Titles, titles. Yeah, if you don't put the jots and tittles in there, you lose the meaning that it was right. written in. In Hebrew. In Hebrew. Hebrew. We don't have jots and tittles. We have apostrophes and. Right. It, it, it makes a big difference only if you're interpreting the verse to be out of context, Jesus is promising verbatim identicality of the Hebrew text. If you read the verse in context, as Glennie has done and as you have done, you see that Jesus is talking about its exactly perfect fulfillment. I believe that I, I, agree, I agree with Craig. I agree with Glennie in this case. I think Glennie has the right interpretation. I think the passage is, is intending to say that the entire law, down to the most minute part, Christ is going to what? Christ is going to fulfill. Okay, Tom? Oh, then Nate? It was just a thought that why argue for 
a stroke of a pen on a letter when we know that that Hebrew text is going to have to be translated into numerous languages and there's not a right or wrong, there's more than one way to translate something in Hebrew in a different language. So you've lost. It's, it, 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 it's not doing an argument for preservation any favors to use this text to, to assert something that I, that clearly, now, Clearly it didn't happen because if it happened, we'd be able to look out into the, we'd be able to look out into the historical evidence and see that it happened that way. If that's what God intended, we should see evidence that that's what happened. But that's not what we see. So what ends up happening is King James only advocates then they have to hedge. They're arguing for pristine exact identicality, but then they quote guys talking about how it was almost what? It was almost identical. Well, it was almost identical, then it wasn't verbatim. Nate? Well, I think as far as the inspiration part goes, I don't think this is really an issue between options one and two. No. Technically, either one of them could affirm that God verbally, plenarily inspired the original. Right. Neither one of them would necessarily disagree with that. Argument. Both do assert that. Right. Both some, both some of both parties do assert that it was verbally, plenarily inspired down to the jot and tittle. They wouldn't have a problem. That's not the issue. The issue is how it's preserved. And the same thing with this. I think Glennie is right in his interpretation that primarily it's not preservation. Secondarily, it would be preservation because of all the things that have not happened yet that Christ will fulfill in. The preservation is indirect. Indirect. So, in other words, are there parts of that law that Christ has not, that have not yet been fulfilled? Yes. Yes. Will Christ fulfill them? Yes. So, Will so so that means the law still has to continue to be what in existence. in existence and preserved. What it doesn't mean though is that it extends all the way to those fine what yes. fine jots and tittles, right? And that's a similar argument to what we've seen in the past when we looked at verses in Isaiah. Okay, did you have anything else to say? Okay, so look at the conclusion then. In the past. In the past, I believed that Matthew 5.17 through 18 taught jot and tittle preservation. When I taught the series Final Authority Locating God's Word in English here at the church in 2010, I used Matthew 5.17 and 18 to assert the notion that preservation took place with exact identicality. Okay? Now... In light of further research and study, I would no longer hold to my former position on Matthew 5, 17 and 18. This does not mean, however, that I do not believe in the fundamental promise of preservation. Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is simply a text, excuse me, is simply teaching that no detail of the law is going to go unfulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect fulfillment of the righteous requirements of the law to accomplish our justification. And any part of that that is yet unfulfilled because of a dispensational understanding, will he fulfill in the future? Yes. yes. So is Christ going to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law in its total down to the most smallest detail of what that law requires? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Given that the passage is not asserting that the Old Testament was preserved with exact identicality, there is no reason to argue by extension that Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is teaching the verbatim preservation of the New Testament. This is a King James only argument used to buttress their position of perfect or verbal plenary preservation. Okay? So... As I said in Lesson 28, God promised to preserve His Word. Number one. Number two, God did not see fit to preserve His Word by preserving the originals. This is self-evident because the originals what? If God needed to have the originals to preserve His Word, then we would have what? We would have them. We would know what they were, and everybody would know where they were at, and we would know, it wouldn't be a question. Okay? Number three. God did not supernaturally overtake the pen of every scribe, copyist, or typesetter who ever handled the text 
to ensure that no differences of any kind enter the text. How do we know this? Because there's differences. There's differences in the Byzantine manuscripts, there's differences in the Text of Septus editions, there's differences in the King James editions. Not to mention the differences between the Byzantine and the Alexandrian manuscripts, which is a whole other thing we're going to get to later on. Okay? So, fourth, if the standard for preservation is plenary or pristine identicality, why did God not just preserve the originals and thereby remove all doubt? Didn't God know that a bunch of evangelicals and fundamentalists were going to be arguing about this in the 20th and 21st century? And he could have saved us a whole bunch of grief if he just what? If he just kept those originals, right? But he didn't choose to do it that way, yet the scriptures clearly affirm that he promised he would what? So what we have to do then is we have to adjust our thinking to the scripture, not adjust the scripture to our thinking. Everybody hear what I just said? Okay. So if God intended to preserve his word with verbatim identicality, we would have historical, textual evidence that preservation occurred with that level of precision. But no such evidence exists. This does not mean that one must abandon belief in the promise of preservation in the face of variant readings. Rather, it means that one must amend their understanding of preservation to match what the Bible teaches about the matter. So, to be clear, to all of you and those who might be watching, I do believe in a perfect Bible, if by perfect one means the following. I believe in perfect preservation, if by perfect one means the existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, His nature or character, His doctrine, His dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology, or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve His Word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in His character or doctrinal content Despite not, having, despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. The scriptures inform me that God can say the same thing different ways and have them both be what? Have them both be correct. Now, are there examples that we could look at and that we will look at where the, where the wording has been altered so much so as to change the substantive nature of what is being said? Yes. I believe yes. Okay? So we're kind, of at this, we're, we're kind of at this position here. Next Sunday, what I intend to do with Lesson 46 is... There's one more issue I want to talk about, and that is the uh, relationship between the authority of Scripture and their preservation. There was one comment in, in today's lesson that sort of touched on that, and I said we'll talk about that next week. And then I want to kind of wrap up this segment where we've been talking about the corollary and the extent of preservation next Sunday, so that then after that we can start discussing its methodology and location. Okay? So, you know, we're already in Lesson 45. I told you that when we started this, I had no idea how long it was going to take me to cover all this material. But what I did say is that I was going to try to present this to you in an orderly, systematic fashion that you would understand. And let me just say this. I've gone back through some of the first lessons, and if I had to do it over again, I would not have started the way I started. Because on some of this stuff, I put the cart before the horse, and I assumed that some, I assumed that, you, that, that, that you already had some understandings about certain things that it became clear to me we didn't have. Okay? But now we can kind of circle back to some of that, and I can draw out some of what we talked about earlier on, and now it will actually make sense. Okay? Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Mike? Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. <laughs>
are we allowed to, to, to go and study and change the, the text of it? Uh, for instance, use the Dead Sea Scrolls to uh, revise the, the Masoretic text, for instance, as the, revised, the new Revised Standard Version did. Okay. Well, first off... Uh, without, without changing the, the, the meanings, that, uh, I, would, me, I would say that... I, so here, here's what I'm saying. I understand that in order for me to be consistent, there's certain things that I, it, I'm sort of, I'll say it this way. If there is, I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not calling for that. I'm not saying that should happen. I'm happy with what I have. Is it theoretically possible? I would think as long as somebody is not substantively altering the text and what it's teaching. Okay, but I don't know who I... I what happened in um, the, the assemblage of the 47 plus men in the early 17th century that the scholars, the collected scholarship of what happened there I think is unsurpassed and while I don't think there was any supernaturally hoodly do going on, I think what they did there was adequate for what we need to have in English. I don't, I don't see there needing to be um, any, any of that going on because what inevitably happens is it never just stays at what it's intended to be. It always goes further than what was intended. So for example, when that revision committee met in the 1870s, if you, and we'll study this in detail later on in this class, I feel like I say that every week, but if you look at what their initial charter was, it was, to, it was to simply go to the current King James text and revise, update some of the spellings, do that sort of a thing. But the result was the production of an entirely fundamentally different English Bible based upon different manuscripts. It was not simply a revision of the King James. So any, I guess I would be... I have to be consistent and say something like that is theoretically possible. Do I think that the level of scholarship exists today that they would do it in a way that I think uh, would be adequate? I don't know. Um, but of course, you know, I'm already I'm already saying things that some people are going to be really upset about. Yeah. And you have to assume to know that whatever you found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was better than what you already have in your Bible, and there's really no way to. And I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls present two problems, as I understand it. The Isaiah Scroll is, like we've read the last two weeks, an almost identical match to the Hebrew Masoretic text for the book of Isaiah. There are also other, re other things in the scrolls that are substantively different from the Masoretic text. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, as I understand them, are somewhat of a mixed bag. And that they, they include documents that support the traditional Hebrew text, but they also, within the same collection of manuscripts, have readings that are contrary or different from the traditional Hebrew text. So that is a whole other issue. But they are years older. They are older. Wow. Not, there's no dispute that they are older. But then you get into the, again, and we'll, we'll get into this when we start talking about the copying process, but the whole idea that original is better, or closer, older is better, is not an idea that is found in the scripture. That is an idea that these guys came up with in response to these guys. Okay? But we'll get into all that later. Craig, you had a question? No, I was just going to back with where it was talking about if God had preserved the originals. I don't think it would have helped anything anyway. It would just be arguing over the interpretation of the original. The infinite number of things to argue about, and if you add one more thing to the infinite, you still have an infinite number of things to argue about. And it would just be, you just be arguing about something different other than what's the original one. It's probably true. All right, we got to quit. Appreciate your attention. Next week, we'll wrap up this segment with Lesson 46.